News at 7. Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan and Amy continues next on AM560, The Answer. This hourly segment is brought to you by Papa Nicholas Coffee. Papa Nicholas Coffee, a family tradition since 1897. Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan and Amy continues now. And make sure to stay tuned to catch me, Mike Gallagher, coming up at 9, only on AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. If you want communism or socialism, I think you should read more about China. You should read my story first to know what the socialism really is. Those are the words of Jennifer Zhang. She's the editor of Epoch Times. She's the author of the book Witnessing History, One Woman's Fight for Freedom and Falun Gong. And she's also the star of the award-winning documentary Free China, The Courage to Believe. She gave an interview at DailySignal.com that I'll tweet out again that we talked about a few days ago when it first came out. Um, but uh, you wanted to hear directly from Ms. Zhang about uh, her life and the lessons from it for those who are wooed by the siren song of socialism in this country at present. For more on this topic, we're pleased to be joined by Jennifer Zhang. Jennifer, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, why don't uh, we just uh, start at, uh, at uh, the beginning of your story, at least your story of persecution at the hands of the Chinese government. What what happened to you? What did you live through in China? Uh, after the persecution of Falun Gong started in 1999, I was arrested four times and then threw into a forced labor camp, Beijing female labor camp. And there I suffered unimaginably inhuman torture. And I witnessed all those things happening to me. I feel like being um, thrown directly into hell. And every day it was endless torture and a struggle between life and death. They shocked me with electric batons until I lost consciousness. They tied the female young Falun Gong practitioners on the chair, shocked her with electric bantons on her head, on her private part, until she lost control of her movement. And also in the labor camp, some other labor camp, they threw female Falun Gong practitioners into male prisoners, prisoner cells and have them repeatedly gang raped. And they flee. Pervasion was so cruel. I witnessed people actually driven into insanity because of this. The longest period, you would not believe it. There was a lady called Zhang Yijie. She was not allowed to sleep for 42 days, 42 nights in a row and tortured endlessly. And the, pur- the purpose, the police said, the purpose for us to be sent there is to get us reformed. In other words, to get us to give up our belief in truth, compassion, and forbearance. And another very sinister thing is we were there actually to be kept as the live organ bank so that Anyone, if anyone from America, from the West, from any country or inside China needs an organ for organ transplant, we would be killed on demand so that our organs could be sold to this person. So inside the labor camp, every one of us were um, given repeated physical checkups, and uh, including blood tests. So you never really don't know when you can become a victim of organ harvest. Jennifer, how did you find the strength every day to continue to keep fighting to to save your own life? It was so hard. I, I remember in the first six months, every day, it was a struggle. I was trying to hold on to my belief and to hold on to a determination, no. This is so evil. No, this, I will not uh, reform whatsoever. And then after six months, one day I suddenly developed a very strong desire to expose this all because I couldn't believe it's still happening 
in the so-called New China of 21st century. I thought that could, that should be stories in the last concentration camp during Second World War. So I developed a very strong desire uh, to write a book. But immediately I was faced with another dilemma. If I don't reform, I would never be released. If I want to be released, I need to reform. And so for the next six months, every day, I was struggle between my own consciousness because if I have to betray all what I believe, and I also was by the police to torture my fellow Falun Gong practitioners who haven't been transformed yet. Now, so I... every day I struggle. I struggle between I couldn't make peace myself, and that struggle internally also killed me another 1,000 times. I, I want to just go back for people who are not familiar. So uh, explain uh, Falun Gong, the, the religious and spiritual practice, and, and why the Chinese government targeted uh, Falun Gong members. What, what, uh, you talk about you needed to be reformed. What is it that the Chinese government finds threatening about Falun Gong, and why were you targeted? Yes, our uh, Falun Gong basically is a spiritual, you can say, practice. Buddhist, uh, Buddhist school. So Falun Gong uh, believes in principles, uh, three principles to follow in daily life. That is, uh, they are truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. And also there are five sets of gentle daily exercises to do Buddhist meditation. So it was first introduced to the public in 1992 as one of thousands of Qigong practices in China. Uh, however, because of its very obvious benefit, people did benefit after practicing it. So it developed very, very fast. And initially, the government actually supported it because it saved the government money if people become healthier. So within seven years, in 1999, uh, um, after the Chinese Public Security Administration did some investigation, they found out there were more Falun Gong practitioners than communist party members in China. So their estimation is the number was something between 70 million to 100 million. So, you know, in China, China is a one-party totalitarian control, control, totalitarian country, and the party has absolute control over everything, including people's ideology and people's thoughts. Then there suddenly appears such a large group of people who believe in something else other than communist ideology. So the party felt they could not tolerate it. They need to target it, them. They need to either eliminate them uh, physically or, men or ideologically. So that's why the transformation happened. That's why I was also targeted, because I was also one of the so, Falun Gong practices. Jennifer, how were you able to escape the labor camp or get out of it? Yeah, that was the most heart wrench point. Like I said, I struggled for six months to try to convince them that I have uh, been reformed. Okay. That process was very, very hard, and and it was very, very a uh, disgraceful, shameful process for me. So finally, after I remember the last night before I was released, I was forced to watch over a teenage girl who was just sent to the camp to make sure that she did not fall asleep. As I said before, sleep deprivation is one of the most commonly used method to them, for them to transfer Falun Gong practitioners. So I didn't sleep for a whole night. I feel so banned. I feel it was meaningless for me to be released she, if she and all the others were still there. Anyway, after I had to do all these things the police forced me to do, I was finally released. But 
I wasn't, you know, taken back to home. Instead, I was taken to the local police station directly from the labor camp. And the local police director told me I was expected to go to the brainwashing centers to continue to be used as an example of, of transform, transformation and help them to transform others uh, continually. So I had to escape from my home only five days of my release. And I was fortunate enough because I speak English. I met an Australian couple who went to China to teach English. And I told them how desperately I needed to escape China. And through their help, I was able to go to Australia to seek asylum and grant refugee status there. That's a story. I think, um, I think, uh, uh, well, I, I'd like to get your take on this. How the Chinese Communist Party markets itself inside the country of China, because from what the Great Leap Forward, Mao's Great Leap Forward, to the Cultural Revolution, to Tiananmen Square, to present, what's the body count at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party? 80 million? 80 million people who've been unnaturally. Uh, their lives are naturally shortened or outright murdered by the Chinese Communist Party and its various appendages inside that country. So, uh, yes. how, so how does the government market itself to the people, though? How does how does you know um, going back to Mao's little red book and 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 pushing it all the way forward to President Xi? I think that's the most sad part of the story. Even uh, as the outsider, we know the party had has done so many terrible things. But inside China, it was still portrayed as the glorious, the always glorious, the always great, the always, you know, um, wise party. Because inside China, it has so tight control over the information people can get. They write, they rewrite all the history. They rewrite all the textbooks. So mm. inside China, even if now it's internet uh Time, but through the help of some Western technology company, the China, the Chinese Communist Party was able to build up a so-called Great Firewall. So people can only access information and what the party wants them to see and to know. So, so they still, even now, they know some bad stories of the party, but somehow they were instilled with this tech, with this kind of uh, idea. Even if the party has problems, but other governments, the, all the governments in the world are the same, and if uh, and the West. Uh, always bad mouth in China because they always want to knock China down. If China owns to without the party, uh, the party somehow saved China from the old bad days. So this kind of mentality have, has already been very, I think, successfully given to many ordinary Chinese people. So they, are, they, they agree there's so many problems of China, but somehow they they accept it that everywhere is the same. It's nothing wrong for the party to, to do something bad, to maintain their power. If I were the party, I would do the same to maintain my power. So that became a very general, general you know, idea or mentality of the uh, ordinary Chinese people. So that's why Although they have done so many bad things, they are still able to be in power. So, Jennifer, with uh, what you experienced and lived through in China and what you see now on the ground in America, are there any concerns you have about the direction America is heading? Yes. Actually, yesterday I just wrote an an article in response to a recent, I think there were there are over 100 scholars, diplo, formal diplomats, military officials, and business person who wrote an open letter to President Trump and and members of the Congress titled "China is not an enemy." I think it it is very worrying that many people are believing in socialist stuff or or they are still doing i has i think have a um, very harmful and wrong illus- illusions 
as many people have done in back in China. I think before the CCP came to power, many people went back from overseas country uh, to China, and some people choose to stay in China with, instead of going outside of China because they believe what the Communist Party told them. Because the ideology of socialism or communism sounds so appealing, everybody is equal, everybody has an equal something uh, uh, of anything. So people are very easily be attractive to that kind of uh, uh, equal and free and everybody enjoy this and social status and uh, the government look after everybody. Yeah. But in practice, mm -hmm. yes, if we look at what the, the communism and the socialism has done to all the people in the world, I think we should have nonsense woken up from that very harmful illusion. One would think and hope. Jennifer 